G'day and welcome again to another Campfire Project uh, panel discussion. And today I have with me Adam uh, Chilton, who is a qualified mental health first aider. How are you, Adam? I'm all right. How are you? Really good, thank you. And we have uh, Paul Stratton Stevens, who is a future mindset coach. How are you, Paul? I'm fine, Alan. Nice to be here. Really great to have you. We've got both of you, uh, gentlemen from uh, England, with us today, with uh, Sharon. Uh, uh, Chamello, who is a teacher and life coach here in Australia. How are you, Sharon? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Excellent. So you and I are the uh, Australian contingent to this international call, which I really love. That's it. So we're going to talk about the impact of um, the uh, pandemic, the COVID-19, sorry, COVID-19. It's got my tongue tied. It's still early morning, still haven't got... As I used to say, I've got my wife's teeth in today, the wrong teeth. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, the impact of, uh, on mental health that COVID-19 mm. has had. So I know that, uh, Adam, you've had some experience with uh, mental health issues. Can we yeah. ask you to start the conversation off and talking about how it's impacted in your life? Um, it's, it's impacted a lot uh, due to the fact that we're not allowed out um and being isolated it has a very bad impact on my anxiety which causes me to be depressed and sometimes suicidal thoughts which i'm glad i've not had them today so when you say so how often do these come around how how, how does it manifest um, well, it seems to build up uh, because obviously um, nature, it does have a massive impact when it comes to mental health mm. and it does help. And because we're not allowed out, it just deteriorates it. And at home, there's yourself and who else? Uh, there's my partner and my two kids. So with some people, they're on their own, but in your case, you've got the family there. And so yeah. how are the, the kids uh, feeling at the moment? It's having an impact on them uh, because obviously they're missing the school, they're missing the friends. Uh, but obviously on Friday when I spoke with the head teacher, uh, my son, because obviously he's got an educational health care plan due to his autism, he's allowed back to school. So that gives me, his sister, my partner, a little bit of a break. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So then you, how old is your, uh, your son and your daughter? My son is eight, my daughter is six. Oh yeah, so and how is your daughter finding this, you know, being at home, whether her brother's there or not? So there's a difference, isn't it? There'll be a, the situation when he's home and there's also then the situation what she's feeling when he's not home as well. Um, when he's home and he's in crisis, um, like having a, how do you call it, a meltdown, mm -hmm. she feels pushed out because we have, it takes two of us to calm him down uh, because obviously there's violent outbreaks and all that. So we tend to try and spoil her a little bit because she feels pushed out. But on good days, it's brilliant. We can have a lot of family time. So it gives us the opportunity to spend time with her. So when he's at school, what's it like then with her at home? Even though she can be a little bit of a pain sometimes, um, she's good. She, she's good. Right, yeah. So how about uh, you, Sharon? What have you experienced in this period? Um, well, I, I have that group, as you know, um, for families, supporting families through this time. I set that up as soon as um, uh, Corona hit while I was still working at school. And it picked up, you know, a lot of people very quickly. So people were obviously looking for support. Um, and I'm just noticing that I guess the anxiety levels have reduced, which is a good thing. Um, and people are reaching out for help, which is great. Um, I think the biggest thing for families was the homeschooling, that the parents didn't feel equipped to do that. Um, and certainly if they're trying to work from home as well, 
Um, so I think the best thing we were able to do for them was to say, you know, if you don't get it all done, that's okay. You know, yeah. that you need to um, prioritise mental health of the family over, you know, getting the work done. So, yeah, yeah so I think um, that allowed people just to back off a bit, you know, that if the tribe was saying that's okay, um, you know, that gave them that confidence to, um, to just get the essentials done or just to do as much as they can without, you know, arguments and, and pulling out hair and teeth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because yeah, you can't really learn if you're not in the right uh, mental state, if you're That's under right. pressure. Yeah. You can yeah. try and so get what parents to... were trying to do is sit on their laptops and do their work mm. and then they've got kids over there on their laptops and the kids are fighting and, and mum, I don't know how to do this or dad, can you help me with this? Yeah. And there was a real, a real struggle, a real tug of war going on. Um, so we guided a lot of people through that, that, you know, just small chunks, small blocks, a little bit of outside time. So a lot of mental health strategies to, mm. to keep everybody feeling, feeling good and on top of things. Mm. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And how about you, Paul? Well, I'm sight impaired, so I haven't been outside since um, the 10th of March. Oh, gosh. Because I can't judge distance. So uh, it's, it becomes more problematic. Mm. But to be honest, it's been totally manageable because I do make, most of my work from home anyway. So it's no, <laughs> it's no real difference. So I, I live on the coast right opposite the sea. And we've got a nice big bay window. And when it's nice and sunny, we, we open the window up and it's just like sitting outside. Mm. <laughs> so for my wife and I, that's, that's been absolutely fine. Mm. And... But the only thing we really miss is going for a walk and doing exercise out, out in the fresh air. But we, we've been doing that in, in the building we live in and, you know, up and down the stairs and different exercise regimes and making it fun as well. Like, I mean, for example, when we go up and down, the, it's like three flights of stairs. So my wife will be at the bottom, I'll be at the top. I grab something from a room. I go back down, give her that, and then she has to take it back to the place in the room. And then she comes back with something else. So we make a bit of a laugh of it, you know, because there's only, only the two of us. And then we do other exercises. We do Tai Chi and Qigong, uh, Qigong as well in, in the house. Um, so my wife has to sort of give me some of the... I, I remember it from previously, but we've got it on the TV and my wife sort of gives me some instructions from that as well. So we've been managing pretty okay. Um, and there's been lots of online activity as well. Things like um, Andrea Bocelli in concert. Um, there was a tribute to Andrew Lloyd Webber yesterday and all the musicals. And these things are getting shared around. We have what we call a meetup group over here. I don't know whether you've got that in Australia, having the meetup yep. groups. Hmm. Yep. Well, they, instead of being physical groups now, they're just sharing everything that's an online activity. Hmm. So there's quizzes, there's you know, musical, everything you want. And that's been maintaining the contact with people um, when you're not physically out and about. So, hmm. of course, you know, there's always work as well. Hmm. Well, that. So... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From a mental health point of view, it's been it's been it's been okay. I think the worst thing for me is not not getting a haircut, <laughs> <laughs> which will be sorted tomorrow because I now have some clippers. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, well, I know that um, it's going to affect everybody differently. But you, just in your little description there of you know going upstairs and downstairs, grabbing something, and your wife taking it back again, just reminds me of the old days when my um, uh, wife used to go through. Uh, my the clothing and take stuff out to throw out and I go and grab it and put it back again. Yeah. <laughs> so we had a competition going with that one as well. But, uh, what I was thinking of there is with your, your, Sharon, you're doing support for people. Adam, mm. in your situation, what support have you been getting? What's been available to you? Um, the only support I've been getting is because uh, obviously I've signed up doing a level two mental health award course. Mm which I'm obviously halfway through in completing that qualification. Um, but other than that, with there's been a lot like this, Zoom calls, um, where there's different mental health groups coming on Zoom calls, they've been sending me links via email or messenger. So I've just been jumping on them, socialising that way. And I thought, yeah, I'm getting help with this. Mm. But like, because obviously like two weeks ago, um, I had a panic attack because I was trying to do a bit of self-care myself. 
focused on my own mental health. But I had a mother that messaged me asking for a bit of help because her and the daughter was, believe it or not, top of a cliff, ready to jump to the death. So I was speaking to them for about an hour, hour and a half, which I'm glad they're here today. So I had to run the Samaritans for a bit of help because it I was really struggling. And I'm still struggling today. So when you're able to, you know, somebody reaches out to you and you're able to give them some support, that's giving you some support at the time. It's giving you some purpose. Definitely. At the same time, having somebody else that uh, you can reach out to as well as having that balance is important. Yeah. One of the things that I've heard is that um, uh, here in Australia alone, medication um, prescriptions have gone up by 35% since the lockdown. So a lot more people <clears throat> requiring help. So I think there's a lot of people who were near the border before and now being pushed over the, the edge. And they'd be, they're the ones I'm worried about the most because they're not used to being in that situation. They don't know where to get help at this time. Whereas somebody who's had it for, you know, has mental health issues, has been involved in the system, they know, you know, to a degree where they can go to get help. They can reach out, mm. even though the pressures are going to be great on them, but they've got the yeah. background information. Whereas somebody who hasn't been there before and has now been pushed over the edge with the lockdown, that's mm. going to be a real problem for them. It has. Um, here in the UK, the mental health services are definitely going to take a major hit after this lockdown, I believe it. So how, do, how can we help those um, organisations? Well, first of all, how can we help those, those people? Is there... um, well, straight away, with what I'm passionate about, because I'm clearly passionate about mental health um, in trying to stop the stigma and discrimination, um, I'm actually fighting and, and going to start a campaign in cutting the waiting time from three months to possibly about a month, month and a half. Because obviously, like I've learnt, um, like one in eight men are diagnosed with mental health, one in six women, and one in ten children are diagnosed with mental health every day. So it just it really touches me to know that this is happening, and there's just not enough help for mental health out there. Mm. Next. It makes it really difficult. So it's, if we haven't got the government support, we haven't got the health organisations there to help us, how can we help ourselves? Well, um, well I've decided that I'm going to um, obviously complete these qualifications, do more qualifications, and then I'm going to go, I'm going to gather a team together and I'm going to travel up and down the country in England and become a public speaker to talk about mental health get people talking excellent yeah. yeah from your experience Sharon with working with um, and helping people <coughs> those areas, what sort of things would you offer what would you recommend that they look at well as Adam said um, I think the um, the health system is becoming overloaded particularly at the moment so I'm really pleased to see lots of coaches out there um, helping people on the ground um, and so I've been in my group encouraging coaches to come in and offer their services it's a contribution group um, so people can come in and, and offer their time and their help um, and then uh, it gives it means that everyone's got someone they can go to um, because I'd hate to see people waiting even for a month and a half if they've hit a point where they need help to have to wait six weeks is is incredible you know mm. i mean if you had an infected finger mm. you, you wouldn't expect to wait six weeks and and this is where the as adam said the stigma of mental health or just the perception mm. of mental mm. health you know oh well he's he's in a bad place but he can wait six weeks you know <laughs> mm. um if he's gotten to a point where he's actually reaching out for help then he needs help today, not in mm. six weeks. So, um, yeah. so that's why I'm pleased to see people like yourself, Adam, and then Paul as a coach, a mindset coach. Um, so I think the more people coming through that have done some studies and some training to help mm. people, um, the better. And, and that's something we need to encourage is to send mm. 
kids into um, those studies. You know, um, one of my yeah. favourite coaches in Australia, um, Andrew Pierce, is probably um, the best coach in Australia for anxiety. And um, I'll, I'll put you on to him, Adam. He's got great strategies for anxiety. Brilliant. He was working in Safeway, which is like um, Woolworths. He was, you know, that was his job. He was a manager in a Safeway in Melbourne. Um, and then he had an interest in mental health. So he started studying psychology and then he found that he could fast track it uh, and do it differently um, through a, co a, a college. So he went to um, um, TCI, the, the Coaching Institute, which is the biggest one in Australasia. And now he's, he's coaching people, you know, thousands of people through anxiety. So... Yeah, I, I, I really um, promote coaching and um, mental health, uh, first aid, all of those sorts of courses. I'd like to see parents doing more of that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Victoria, I'll look at that. As you mentioned, there are having more coaches coming through, but I'm glad that you um, uh, also mentioned that those that have done some courses and had yes. some experience. Yes. Because... You know, we know that the second fastest growing um, industry on the planet is coaching and that's because of technology is the first and the technology has caused so many isolation issues with people. Mm. And uh, so it's the fastest growing industry, but quite often we're finding people just getting into that because they have a need themselves. Yes. But, um, uh, and they just start teaching or they just start coaching from uh, their belief systems, not so much their experience. Whereas yes. Adam is going out and studying and learning. Mm. He's got the experience of being in that situation himself, but also mm -hmm. then looking at, well, how does he then put the technical side together? How does he help people mm. with the, the information and knowledge that he's able to um, uh, accrue over that period of time, which is mm. really a necessity. Because, uh, Paul, as a coach, you would know that there's good coaches and there's bad coaches out there and the, what's needed to become a good coach. Yeah, there are. And... It's really difficult if you're going to be, a, shall we say, a customer or client of a coach. It's difficult to choose out there. Mm. And, and I always say, you know, choose the, the best coach for you, not the closest. Mm. Uh, and with technology these days, you, you, you can select the best coach for you. And most co coaches will offer you um, a free session so you can actually experience their, their coaching. Mm. And, you know, if it takes two or three sessions to go through with different coaches, you know, you have a good look at their websites, you get some look at their testimonials, you have a look at their social media links, LinkedIn, for example, because if they're from a professional background, and you see what courses they've done, ask them questions, you know, what's your experience? You know, it's a two-way process. As a, as a new client, you are perfectly within your rights to say, well, okay, how long have you been coaching? Um, what do you specialize in? Uh, what, can you give me an example without mentioning any names or specific cases, but and some recent work you've done. And you can ask all those questions of the coach. And, you know, the coach should be able to answer those questions. If they're not, then maybe you should move on. Exactly. It's, it's, you know. it's really important that you, you know, realise that even when you're, you're feeling depressed and everything else, that the most important person in your world is you. Yeah, you absolutely. have to put yourself first when it comes to this because, okay, Adam, for instance, you know, you've got your wife and you've got your children. Unless you're looking after yourself, you're no good to them. You can't help absolutely. them when you're worn out and exhausted. So you know, if you're under pressure, that's when you really should go, hang on, I am the most important person here. So when you're talking yeah. to the coach, as you've said, Paul, just make sure that you're um, putting yourself in that position, you're not look, put, looking up to them to being the, the bit higher than you. You're looking to them to give you solutions, yes, but you're looking at making sure that you are the most important person in here. So, and in that itself yeah. is a little bit of therapy in itself. Yeah. yeah. Can I just add there as well is that you need to make sure you gel with a coach, mm. you know, that you know, you're know you compatible. And that, that session, I mean, I give up to a two hour session. Um, it's an actual session and it's a two way process. They can see if they're compatible to work with me and vice versa. And if I don't think I'm able to work with a person, I'll pass them on and recommend somebody else that I think might be able to work with them. Yeah. And I think another check there that you can do as well is if the coach belongs to a reputable organization like the Association for Coaching or the ICF or, you know, it gives credibility for the coach. Mm. And I think that's, that's important too. It gives, for, the, for the client, it gives a bit more reassurance.
you know yeah. they've been they've been through some formal um, <coughs> education <coughs> excuse me they've been through a formal education so they've got some knowledge behind it then yeah. in that uh, time that you spend uh, going through that session with them you're working out whether they also have the experience to be able yeah. to uh, help you and as you said very importantly be uphold that they uh, gel with you as well or you gel with yeah. them yeah yeah super important mm -hmm. yeah so one thing I was going to ask you, Sharon, is you mentioned that you've got, you know, you've got the group that you're bringing people in to uh, support and everything else. What other groups are there out there that are doing similar things to you? Have you looked for those? Are you connected to any of those at all? Oh, yeah, most of them. Um, well, our friend Mary Lou uh, Coombs, yep. she, has, she has that um, parenting group. You've got some parenting mm. um, groups going on. Um, I, I do make contact with um, just about everyone that I that I spot mm. and, and check out their work and collaborate so that, um, as you say, if, if one coach, or as Paul said, if one coach doesn't suit, then mm. you can recommend them to somebody else. I think that's, mm. that's part of the game, you know. I, I used to work in um, educational publishing and sales and marketing and, and the biggest thing was the networking making sure that you knew the industry so that mm. if you couldn't help somebody, you could at least recommend someone who could. So, um, yeah, so I, I maintain contact with most of the parenting groups. I'm probably adding another parenting mm. group every day at the moment, mm. you know, as soon as I see them pop up. So, um, yeah, it's just, just so that we're, we're gathering as much information as possible and putting mm. it into the pot. So that um, so if part of the issue is 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 the health of the teenager, for example, you know the 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 actual um, not just the mental health but the physical health, you know, if they're overweight or if they're not eating well, um, if they're being triggered by certain foods, by sugars mm. or whatever, we can we can refer them to someone who can uh, look mm. at that issue for them because mm. it's the whole picture, isn't it? You know, it's not just um, mm. strategies well they are all strategies for mental health but it might not be just mm. up here it might be the whole mind body mm. uh even gut connection so yeah, yeah. yeah. well as i say we are the the uh, you know, the combination of all of our experiences and everything else and we're also the combination of our physiology neurology and everything else yes. that work together yeah. yeah so we know that our thoughts create chemical reactions mm. and those chemical reactions hit different organs. So depending on what our emotions are, will affect different parts of our body. We also know that what we ingest through um, foods, mm. through um, all medication, drugs, everything else, how they impact on us and uh, how our body, if any physical injuries that we have, they, how they affect back into our um, mental thoughts as well, our emotional health, health as well. That's so right. there's so much that comes together with it. It's, um, there's also in our group, we've got uh, Lisa Jane and we've also got um, uh, Jackie Bloom as well, who run mm. their, their groups. And so mm. and this is one of the things of bringing the campfire together was for more coaches to be able to connect with each other yeah. and to find out and so that we can become a, a more global community of helping people all over the place. But it's, I'm really enjoying this one today because we've got two coaches and we've got Adam who's able to bring his experience to the table that then allows us to go okay what do we need to do to improve what we're doing as well to help those in those situations mm. and with adam also coming into from that side to also now becoming a coaching that is bringing that bridge across between the two absolutely the experience mm. so I think also while we're on the subject there because we've been talking about people who have pre-existing mental health conditions mm. And we have people mental health because coronavirus has, has been fearful for a lot of people. And mm. obviously a lot of people have sadly lost their lives and there's been a knock on from that aspect. But there's, there's a whole group of people that aren't really spoken about very much in the media. And that's a group where these are going to be, to, for better, want of a better expression, people who are new to the mental health arena. Mm. And these are people who have suffered losses. They might seem trivial, compared to mm. life or death or pre-existing conditions, but they've had weddings cancelled. They've got weddings planned, they're not able to do them. They've missed graduations. They, they haven't been able to travel or get vacations. Mm. But, you know, they've missed, they take a day off for their wife's birthday or anniversary every year and they can't do that because they're on lockdown. All these small but 
trivial, shall we say, in, in the whole scheme of things, these trivial events, but they're losses. Mm -hmm. And they just, and mental health is a, has a cumul cumulative effect mm -hmm. as well. And if we have the effects of coronavirus and the fear of that and everything that goes with lockdown, and then these other losses along the way, then we've got a whole tranche of new people who are going to be suffering from some kind of mental health. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and I think they shouldn't be forgotten either. That's it. And that is just say that's you know, and it's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up because you know it's a long term. How long is you know we think okay, Corona is, you know, will be over. We'll get back to the so-called normal, and I well, hope we don't get back to normal. I think yeah. um, I'd like to think that we be we become more social. We'd be more con uh, emotionally connected to each other. I really hope that doesn't change. Mm. And in that, we might have a bit more compassion and that into the future because as you said you know if you you know it's a close uh, family member who's passed away and you haven't been able to go to their their funeral mm. you're going to remember that right until the day you die and that's going to be something that's underlying there and other things that impact mm. in your life are going to have a greater impact because that has already had an impact there it's already there at the time yeah and even well, weddings are important as well, especially to the, the women, for instance, this is their day, their biggest day. Hopefully the only one that they have in their life, they only get one, married once, so it's a really important one. And not to be able to have their friends and family and things like that around. I know that, you know, I sit there with my um, uh, granddaughter and she opens up her, the, the album of all the photographs. And you can see her light up and everything else going back to that. So they're going to miss that opportunity that into the future where they could bring the album out. They can talk about their wedding and other things. They can talk to their children about those weddings. All of that stuff has been lost. So there's, as you said, Paul, there's a massive accumulation that's going to affect, I would say, probably the majority of the population. Yeah. I mean, I've got, I've got a friend in Spain who's, who's due to get married in October. And all the, they're in the planning phase. They've been in the planning phase for the last sort of nine months. Mm. She can't go to like wedding dress fittings. They can't go and sample the food. They can't go and see the cake being, you know, everything in, involved in the, the planning of the wedding. So they're not sure it's all booked for October. They can't sure, they're not sure where they can have it. Mm. And if so, how it's going to work. Mm. They have no idea whatsoever. And equally, I mean, just before we hit lockdown here, as a lovely couple we know in, in the locality, and they were just having a major birthday and they'll be getting people from Belgium, people from Ireland, and they're all going to come over and have a surprise party. Mm. Uh, Everything cancelled, obviously. Mm. You know, yeah, so the, I, the, I would... Mm. Go on, Paul. I'm going to say the effect on people is, you know, incomprehensible, really. Mm. Adam. Yeah, I was, I was going to have um, an engagement party, my own engagement party on the 25th of March. I couldn't do that and the pub was literally about five minutes walk from where I live. I couldn't do that. No. And the the impact of that, you know, if you don't mind sharing, Adam, what's been the impact of not being able to have that? It's really brought um, tears to my eyes um, because obviously I've been looking forward to this for years on this and obviously I know me and my partner have had rocky times um, I think all relationships do but and nobody ever believed we'd actually pull through with being engaged and then going to get married but then when we actually booked the day and made all these invites um, we were talking about about 30 people going to come and they were all looking forward to coming and this lockdown has just hit us unexpectedly so what have you done? Have you just postponed it for now or is what's happened? We've postponed it for now and it's just a matter of when can we do it again? Hmm. And even though that you know that somewhere in the future you'll be able to do it, there's still an impact in that time until you're able to actually have that event. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So these are the things I think that really aren't looked at or we pass over because we're looking at the extremes. We look at, okay, the number of deaths that the uh, coronavirus will take directly. We then look at the indirect ones with the increase in uh, suicides. We talk about then the increase in domestic violence, the increase in um, uh, depression and things like that. But we look at it being from people who are 
already had it. We haven't really thought about the increase, but then we've had 35% increase in the pharmaceutical um, uh, prescriptions. And so we've got more people who are into that category. But as you pointed out, Paul, we have uh, one thing that most people aren't looking at would be the, the people, the long-term effect that's underlying that we won't see somebody step up and need medication for, but how that affects them. And that flows, because everything flows on. If you're not happy, then your spouse is not happy. Those I used to say, happy wife, happy life. But really, it comes down to the fact of happy human, happy life. So if the man's not happy, the wife's not happy. If the wife's not happy, the man's not happy. But all around, the kids aren't happy. And everybody they come in contact with, that impacts. So the flow-on effect of this is, is massive. If we step right back from the picture, it's like, you know, Something spills on the floor and the, the main puddle's there, but a little bit just slowly drifts out and it seeps in and disappears, but it's still in the material. So you drop something on the carpet, for instance, there'll be the major patch, but that will have actually extended underneath the surface and out deeper across the, the carpet. And it's the same thing with this. So how do we help those people? Or Because again, We've got the stigma. I've just come off the back of a three-day uh, modern uh, masculine uh, summit, which was all really covering a lot of mental health issues and the fact that you know men's beliefs about being strong and everything else. Therefore, if you you don't suck it up and you're not tough, then you you've got a weakness. And so we've got that side of things. There's so many people who may have had the uh, viewpoint before that somebody else with mental illness has a problem. They you know they're not. Um, Oh, that'll never happen to me. But now with everything here is now impacting on those people, that's going to really damage their, um, their belief systems about themselves. And if they've already had a stigma towards other people with mental health, that's really gonna hit them even harder again. So there are so many things that, are, that we're not looking at in this overall process. See, yeah, when it think... comes... Sorry, go when on, come, yeah, when it comes to the media or the news, I f completely refuse to watch it. I refuse because not only does it make me depressed, but obviously what I saw two weeks ago, or even last week, whenever it was, just London alone, 24% in rise in domestic violence within relationships. And the media will not cover that. They will not talk about it. And that's what really gets to me. Hmm. So when there's in the measurement of that as well, like the 24% increase, is that 24% more people in there or is it 24% more reports so that some people will be perpetrating it more often than what they were 24, before? Um, I think it's 24% of um, victims uh, are either coming forward or perpetrators. I, I don't know. So it's but an increase it's in people nice. reporting it, not so much the Possibly, increase in yeah. reports. Possibly. Because yeah. yeah. that's the thing as well as to understand that has, and I think, yeah, the stats and the information coming out doesn't go deep enough. It doesn't break it down enough. People just use that little bit that they want at the top. If somebody wants a story about something, they'll just grab that bit at the top, but it doesn't talk about the story that's underneath it, the deeper information, because that's what we need. Unless we have all that, how can we make the proper decisions? Yeah, I think in, in the news today, just today in, here in the UK, that the government have recognised there is a, a real surge in domestic violence and they've allocated X amount of millions in order to help with that between now and the end of the lockdown and beyond. Yeah. And that, that was announced today. That's in, that's in today's news. So mm. what the implications of that are, I don't know the full ins and outs of it, but at least they've recognised it and they've publicised it, mm. which is a step in the right direction. Mm. It's something that's definitely needed. At the same time, we yeah. need, need to be working at, you know, most of this stuff is after the fact. So we're fixing problems. We're not working on solutions which are up front of it. That's the thing yeah. that, and that I can make that statement quite easily, but do I have an answer to it? Truthfully, no, I don't. But it's no. one that's in my thoughts, you know, how do we find answers to that? How do we work on solutions before the fact? You know, it's like, it, 
I worked with, uh, well, I had a, a group in Newcastle called the Hunter Star Foundation, which was about helping children uh, before they crashed and burned. And we went for government support, you know, the um, non-deductible gift certificate, so we're not for profit. And we couldn't get it because the tax office said the kids hadn't crashed and burnt yet. Ah. We were trying to prevent it. Mm. Now, if you try and prevent it, it costs you a hell of a lot more, less money to prevent something than it does to fix it after the fact. As always. You know, yeah. that if your car's got a little bit of a, a rattle in it and everything else, you get that fixed. If you don't, next mm. thing you know, you blow the motor and it becomes very expensive. Mm. And that's virtually the, the scenario of what's happening here. And so we're looking at after, it's always wait until the horse is bolted, then we'll shut the, the um, stable gate. Mm. And yeah. so we put a lot yeah. of money into it. So how do we start addressing this stuff? How do we start to recognise uh, issues before they've, they've, you know, they've blown up, they've been an explosion where they're obvious? When can we pick it up when it's just a little spark? It's not the neon light. You know, the ways around that. I noticed, at Alan, I don't know if you noticed, in the first few weeks of uh, corona in Australia, there were lots of news reports um, on the telly you know, saying that we would expect an increase in uh, domestic violence. And I found myself shouting at the television, give them a phone number, you know, mm. where's the, like, it's all right to report, oh, we mm. do expect an increase because there'll be people out of work and there'll be, um, you know, trying to homeschool and there'll be family stresses and not being able to see the elderly and not having that, that mm. extra support from the extended family. And they, and they just kept saying there will be, there will most likely be mm. an increase in uh, family violence. <laughs> I don't know how many times I shouted at the, at the box, you know, give them, a, give them a strategy, give them something, you know, if, if you're starting to feel fired up, mm. here's the number to ring or, you no, know, um, here's uh, three ways of calming down, you know, go mm. for a walk or, or um, make a cup of tea, you know, yeah. like anything. There's some strategies. But, yeah, well, yeah. I, I find that I quite often yell at the news as well and yeah. I then look around and think, my God, I'm glad that no one's watching because they'd be <laughs> out there with the white uh, jackets ready to take me away. But, um, They'll lock us up for sure. Uh, but that's the thing as well is that we found that, well, putting a, a headline out like that creates mm. fear, it gets people stirred up mm. and it sells newspapers. But it's yeah. always a case. It's one of the things that we've had a lot of talks <coughs> excuse me, in the campfire, but I've always been looking for not only just talking about a problem that may exist, but do we have remedies for it? Do we have ideas? Yeah. Do we have something that we can become constructive? Yeah. Yes, there is a problem. We all know about the problem, but what can we do? Mm. And as we know that governments, you know, news, everybody else, they're all pointing. It's one finger pointing. But if you notice when you've got that one finger pointing, where are the other three fingers pointing? Mm. It that comes could, back yeah, to quite. each of us. What mm. can we do first? Instead of saying, well, they should have done this, they should have done that. My uh, comment to myself is, what have I done? What yeah. could have I do? do? Mm. Not even after yeah. the fact, but what can I do now? Yes. That's why I'm asking these questions as to, you know, and I'm glad Paul brought it up, as to the other victims or the other people, that's other sufferers who are the silent majority who are going to suffer that we're not going to do anything about. Mm. We'll never hear mm. about until they get into the category of, of mental health yep. and they become part of yeah. the statistics mm. if you're going to work on yes we need to work on those that are in that category but we also need to work at the other front end trying to stop the flow into there yeah how, how can we break the supply of people going into that uh, that situation mm. i think one of the things you said earlier on alan about you know we're responsible for what we ingest mm. into our bodies you know medication food drink etc etc and mental health just like any other aspect of health mm. Mm. you know we think about foods and how we feed our body but we need to think about what we feed our brains mm. Mm. and the news is, is is not is not good you know because let's face it how how often do you see a good piece of news in proportion to the not so good piece of news mm. so I, i've been saying to people I've, i work with recently and i've been talking to recently you know select one piece of news a day mm. you know don't hit the news before you go to bed if you have sleeping problems or you're anxious or have anxiety you know mm. do it first thing in the morning catch up on the news in the morning and then you got the rest of the day to distract your mental health mm. you know with more positive things 
Mm. You know, we just need to train it out of ourselves. If you've got a habit of that or buying the newspaper every morning, change your habit. Mm. Yeah, well, mm. the newspaper is a little bit like um, uh, overdosing on sugar, isn't it? Yes. The newspapers yeah. or the media is the, um, the sugar uh, mm. thing that we're taking at the moment. And we think we're trying to sweeten our lives, but we're not. The sugar is mm. actually destroying our, our system. Mm. And so it's the same with the media, being very careful about what we ingest. As I said, whatever you uh, think about is going to create those chemical reactions and they're going to go through your body. Mm. Yeah. Now you've got it's not just problems as well. Yeah, I mean, it's not just the news, it's social media as well. Yeah. You have to limit the amount of social media because mm. you get good news, you get not so good news, and you get absolute mm. blatantly fake news as well. Mm. But when people's mental health starts to deteriorate, then they start to question things and maybe believe things that they weren't, aren't actually true or they've got no authentication for. Mm. And what we need people to do is to train themselves out of these older habits. Mm. Take mm. on some, you know, look at positive stress that mm. helps us build resilience and start building like a, an anti-fragile mindset. So mm. you become more tough and more resolute and more resilient. Mm. Yeah, because we know that with um, uh, advertising and things like that, if it's something like toothpaste, for instance, if the person is a uh, dentist, but also is wearing a white um, jacket, mm -hmm. uh, lab jacket, then we give them more credibility. Mm -hmm. And yeah. every man and his dog's been on there. I get through Messenger, I'm getting videos sent to me by the dozens every day. And sorry, people out there, I'm not opening any of them. I go, oh yeah. So they know that I've read it. I can see that the thing's sitting there, <laughs> but I don't bother playing them mm -hmm. because, and especially if it's anything around the health side, you know, everyone's having a go at Bill Gates at the moment. They're having a go at other people. I'm going, hang on. Who are the people who have the who've got solutions? All these other people are whinging about somebody else and saying that they're wrong and they're doing the wrong thing. But where's the person who's saying that with the background and the, the actual knowledge who is saying, hey, this is what we should be doing? For every one of those, there's probably a hundred others. So sifting through and finding yeah. the right ones, as Paul, you said, finding that one bit of news, but find the one that's actually from a, a valid source, somebody yep. that we can, well, trust for one of a better word, because trust is not really out there at the moment, um, but find someone like that and then discount everything else. Because it's like, it's almost like you're being gaslighted, where you've been told that there's something wrong with you and everything else because of all the reports that are out there. And it's not just one person gaslighting you, it's all those different sources. They're trying to manipulate people's minds. Yeah. So. And if you're already in a fragile state under pressure and stress, then you're even more susceptible to it. So you've got to be even more strict mm. what you ingest. Mm. Not just through the mouth, but what you ingest through the years, as you've said, Paul. Yeah. And, and I think it's really helpful if you're a, a person who tends to worry. You know, mm. if you've got that tendency, um, schedule some time into the day for worry time. Mm. 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 You know, schedule a short period of time, 10, 15 minutes and really mull over things in your head. But then make sure when you come out of that, you're doing something positive, mm. you know, with purpose and a sense of purpose. Mm. But schedule that time in. How would that work with you, Adam? Um, well, going back to the all the blaming likes on like Donald Trump, Bill Gates and all that. I have I've seen all this, and I was I was thinking myself because I was actually thinking of doing the same. But I thought, what would I actually achieve from that? Because mm. if I if because if I keep doing if I go and do that, and I'm seeing all these people attacking like to Bill Gates, Donald Trump, whoever, there's more kids that are dying on the streets, mm. veterans, and all that. Mental health percentages are increasing massively. Mm. Why are people not focused on that? Mm. Taking our focus to the wrong place. Mm. Exactly. So with what Paul has just said as well, if, for your own, uh, in your own situation and that, um, looking at the news that does come through, how do you find the, the right news to listen to and what to, to ignore at the same time? You know, things that are troubling you, do you structure time or have you thought of structuring time, like Paul said, where you have that bit of worry time where you can go through it, let it, and then move on to something positive? Do you have something positive already set up after you've watched the, the yeah. news? Yeah. 
well, I don't watch the news. I've only ever watched it once. And what my partner does is mornings and the last thing at night is she watches the news. And it's like, I can't be in the room when that's happening. I physically can't. And then when I'm waking up and I'm seeing it, it sets me up for a bad day. Mm. And I've spoken to her about it. And now, now she's stopped it. She stopped until I've left the room because she knows how much it affects me. Mm. But what I've started doing now is when I leave the room to go and like deal with the kid, make breakfast and all that, we then swap places where she comes down, deals with the kids, and then I go upstairs. But when I'm upstairs, I put on YouTube and I've actually started doing a 10 minute meditation video where I'm meditating in self care myself which I thought I'd never do, but it actually works, and I recommend it for all. Yeah. There's a few uh, paradigms and beliefs that we've had in the past that have been challenged in this period, and some of the yeah. stuff we're going, oh, this is really yeah. cool. But six months yeah. ago, we would have gone, what? <laughs> you're insane. Why would I do that? You know, clear my mind? No, it's empty my mind. No, you're not emptying your mind. You're just letting the stuff travel through. Mm. You're not hanging on. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's, and that's the thing too, is everyone was out there saying, you've got to meditate, you've got to meditate. And I'd heard that for years, but nobody was saying the, the process, how it worked and everything else. Everyone's got, you know, pointing the finger and saying, you've got to do this. Mm. But uh, a lot of those mm. people don't do it themselves because if they can't tell you how to do it, they obviously don't know how to do it for themselves either. Exactly. Everyone's like I was, on... e I was even saying to my partner tonight, because I struggled to sleep anyway, because of the trauma I suffered mm. growing up. And now I've, because I got fobbed off by the NHS last year when I attempted suicide because they didn't think I was mentally unstable enough, um, I've actually gone out my way and I've, I've purchased a trauma book in handling it and trying to control it, which obviously that book's coming tomorrow. But um, I said to my partner, if, if, I'm, if I'm awake, for example, at half three, four o'clock in the morning, I'm going to go out and I'm going to have a run like round the block or something just to warm myself up for the day. Yeah. yeah. And with your, your partner, as you said, is she, she's not watching the news as much as she was before. No. You stopped. How's yeah, that impacted on, it. how's that impacted on her? What have you noticed in her? Um, the lockdown has really affected her. And mm -hmm. because of Sam first day that I can spot the signs, when somebody is suffering and she's she's starting to suffer with depression herself obviously i know i'm not qualified to diagnose her but i can spot the signs mm. and i'm i'm trying everything i can into helping her mm. and and this and this is why i asked her tonight because i i'm going into self-employment with doing this business with public speaking i asked her can does she want to come in with me with this business and she said yeah mm. so take a positive we'll do it together mm. then i don't think it's a matter of you know as you said you know you're not qualified to diagnose but we have are you okay day where we ask somebody you know are they okay mm. um, yeah and that's everybody can do that but then we talk mm. about well learning how to actually speak to someone but it's still learning how to listen to them in a way that becomes a positive way for them so we don't have to be practitioners we just have no. to focus on the other person because when you're thinking about, well, what do I say? You're focusing on yourself. Mm. But if you focus on just listening to the other person, then you've got your focus on them. And that's the thing that they notice. They know that you care. That in itself is therapy. Now, exactly. Yeah. I was interested with your, your wife when she stopped watching the news, did you notice any difference in her behavior? Massively, massively. Cause she started, um, cross stitching a lot more than usual um so she's put in practical instead of just glue to the telly at the world's more because i know when she was watching the news my kids wanted to watch the news and now obviously the other day um which i informed the school when they rang last week my eight year old boy he now wants to learn about mental health and i think that's fantastic because mm. I believe mental health needs to be taught in, in schools. Yeah. Mm. It definitely does. Mm. There's so much there. Okay. Yeah, because it, 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 it has a massive impact. Like self-harm has a the massive percentage 
affects young teenagers mm. the most. So mm. I think it does need to be in education. Mm. You know, I'm always concerned about uh, kids because they've got inquisitive minds, they're sponges, they're taking everything in. Mm. But if they haven't, you know, they don't have the life experiences, so they can be affected you know, more so than somebody's a little bit state, you know, an older person is stayed in the way that they think. Uh, it takes a bit more to change our, our minds about things, whereas the, the children are so malleable mm. that um, mm. we've got to be careful about what influences we allow around them. And this is where yeah. this is one of our roles as a parent is to nurture them in the right way and to set the environment up so we have the right people around them. Mm. So if this we don't do why, that, we have to make sure this, we do it for ourselves. Yeah. This is why, and honestly, I am scared for my daughter because obviously she be, she she's been pushed out because of my son having autism because we're paying more attention to calming him down and meeting mm. his needs. So I am actually scared she's going to grow up and develop mental health issues. I am. Mm. Mm. So there's going to be some, that might be another question, something else to delve into in a lot more detail. You give it the, yeah. you know, the attention it deserves. And sort of throwing it on the right, it's right at the end here. Um, yeah. Because that is something, it's, you know, it comes back to what you said, Paul, about those people who, you know, the weddings and other things are missing out, those low lying stuff. How many of our children, when we have all our focus on one who has, is obviously as noticeable, has uh, mental health issues, mm. what's the impact on the siblings? And how can we then work with them? It's like you've got a, a child, and several years later, you have your second child, or you're focused on the second child, what impact does that have on that first child? How do you include that first child mm. into the raising of that um, of their sibling? so that they feel that they have a place that they belong and they don't get pushed out. We've got to be able to do that with the other children that we have when we've got a child with mental health issues mm -hmm. to make, and that's going to be a really hard one. It's not as easy as you know, getting the child to help you raise the other, you know, the child by helping with the bath and other things like get the clothing and do this for me and spending time together and everything else. It's you're dealing with a child who's in meltdown, for instance, mm -hmm. not throwing a tantrum, but in meltdown, which is where, everything just disappears, all rational mm -hmm. thought goes, and you're trying to then help your other child. How do you help the other child? So we've got to be looking at some techniques and different things there. So that's mm -hmm. a question for everybody out in the campfire project. If you know of anybody who's working in that area, mm -hmm. you know, get them to come along with the campfire project. And maybe we need to start getting some conversations around that as well. Mm -hmm. you now we can uh, get some answers on that. Yeah. And just to pick up on, can I just pick up on Adam's point about, you know, kids need training in mental health. I mean, if I go back now, pre 2008, probably about 2005, there, there were in existence and there still are well-being packages for schools yeah. and colleges. Mm. And those are tiered in such a level where because you have to make sure that the children have got the right maturity and the level of understanding and the complexity of the yeah. issues in order to take on board the information. Mm -hmm. And the well-being package is normally a streamed on and what we call here key stages. Uh, key stage two, key stage three, key stage four, yeah. key stage five. And it's up to the schools how they deliver them. They put them in the normal curriculum or their add-on sessions. And you'll find most schools these days do provide some kind of well-being packages for their mm -hmm. students. Yeah. And within that, mental health comes under that guise. Because mm. that's so. important is to have a strong foundation there. But looking at the expression on uh, Adam's face there, it's something that you haven't heard about. Would that be right? No, I haven't, no. Yeah. So no, because I know, I, I know um, the last day before lockdown, um, we got, we got like, a package full of paperwork brought on with us. And there was nothing about mental health in those paperwork. Nothing. No, they don't. In, in sort of primary, they don't normally refer to it as like mental health for the child. It's normally under a well being because mm. it'll really go over their head for most of the kids. They wouldn't have the maturity yeah. and the understanding for it. So, mm. from an educational perspective, they would, it won't be disguised. It's just presented in a different way. Mm. Right. Yeah. Okay. It, um, there's something that probably needs to be yes presented to the children in that particular way that's needed for the child but an explanation yeah. to the parents of letting them know what they're actually doing so the parents understand yeah. it because yeah. yes you can teach the children but then the children go home if the parents don't know about it they can't support it they yeah. can't give it 
extra emphasis. They, the child, you know, if they're asking questions of the parent, the parent goes, I don't know, I even know what you're talking about. And so that then negates everything that they've learned at school. This is the problem that we, we don't involve enough people. We don't communicate. And I'm, that's why I kept on saying that I hope that that's the one thing that started to happen in the uh, COVID situation that we don't lose where we are starting to communicate with people because you know, I was worked with um, some of the schools and we were going around and looking at, uh, you know, making schools stronger and everything else. And we talked about all the different groups that were out there. When we even brought the groups, all the groups into the same room, they're all looking at each other going, where did you come from? Yeah. They've all been there 10, 15 years and none of them knew about each other. Mm. And they're all trying, some of them were doing the same as each other. Mm. And, because they didn't know about each other, they were ineffective. If they knew the other one, you take the ego out of it and they work mm. together, collaboration, their impact would have been magnified, mm. multiplied. Yeah. Mm. And so that's the other thing too, is being more aware. It's also then talking to people at the right level. So if you're talking to the children in one level, but then let, let the parents know what's going on as well. Mm. Schools need oh. to, if you had those conversations, you're now building a stronger relationship and then if the teachers knew that, especially the principals, they knew that was happening, then they wouldn't be getting the parents coming in and saying to the teacher, why is little Johnny or Jane doing so well at school? What are you doing wrong? You know, they'd be building a relationship. The parents would be happy to go in and talk to the teachers and the principal, and they would know they're not coming in to be attacked, but they're going to someone who understands them, who they relate to, yeah. and have decent conversations. So I'm really hoping that that really has an impact to See, when my son, the loss well, of lives that we've had. When my son asks me what is mental health, I'm not going to sit there and lie to him. I'm going to tell him exactly what it is because mm. I believe we should learn about it. Mm. Yeah, well, you're able to explain older. it, being uh, you know, compassionate to your child and everything else, but you're coming from a place of knowledge of it as well. So Absolutely. they're all able to pick up your emotions and your expressions and everything else. There's a connection of empathy between you. Whereas if yeah. somebody just went and started talking about mental health, who isn't uh, connected to the child and hasn't really had mental health, it comes across like just a, a lecture and it wouldn't have an impact. And it would I'm be glad you scary. Brought, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm glad you brought that up, Alan, because ever since I've told my son what mental health is, me and my son have been a lot stronger when it comes to connecting. So, yeah. Because I would also remove the stigma of what it is as well, so that they understand. Mm -hmm. And as they grow up, they, un they grow up understanding that there are a lot of people out there with it. And as Paul had pointed out all earlier, and, and this is, it's really, and, and Paul, it really impacted on me when you said that. It's something I've thought about, but I keep forgetting about, but it's really driven at home, is that the number of people who are underneath that level, underneath the radar, which is a, is, I think it's like probably like the, um, uh, the iceberg. What we talk about with mental health is that little tip at the top, but the 90% of it is underneath the surface. So the ramifications on other people, and the more that we understand this and we all realize that we are in this together, that we all are emotional beings, we all get impacted by this stuff, that the stigma then starts to disappear because we realize that it can be really close to us. And the fact that it doesn't mean that we're less than anybody else, because everybody else has got it as well at some level or another, <laughs> that it brings us a, a feeling of connectedness to each other and a level of empathy and compassion. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a new way of thinking and you know, I'm really yeah. praying that that's um, what comes out of the, uh, this experience with the pandemic. Cool. Yeah, I think the biggest thing that's coming out here, in, in, especially in, I can only speak for the area I'm in, is community. Mm. You know, it really is community in abundance mm. and uh, even if it carries on at 50 percent of the rate it is doing then that mm. will be a major improvement on what it was before oh definitely mm. and then we can have those conversations where we can have them without stigmas stigmas being placed on things which is really brilliant and anyway. isn't it isn't it ironic that this community is forming when we're socially isolating or when we're physically isolating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> isn't it just, yeah. I mean, there's, there's no that. way we in, in the world, we can go back to living the, the way we lived prior to this. Things have changed. There's something seriously wrong with us. Yeah. 
Yeah, people have definitely realised mm. that they need to form groups and tribes, mm. and even if that means online at the moment, mm. um, and that we need to find our common interests, mm. whether it's education or mental health or gardening, mm. and we need to all uh, support each other for a better world. That, mm. That's that been a, such a positive outcome of all of this. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So what we're finding in the Campfire Project, we've got, you now it's been... Uh, England, it's been Ireland, it's been uh, Canada, America, Africa now as well, New even New Zealand. <laughs> even <laughs> New out, Zealand. <laughs> to call out for Jonathan there, he'll give me a you know, curry over that later on if he listens to this. Uh, but yeah, we've covered just about every uh, continent on the, on the planet. Mm. Uh, just need to now get some of those guys who might be at the North or South Pole doing uh, research on the internet, get them to come on. Yeah. And have a chat. So actually, if anybody's got any connections out there, I'd love yeah. to have a talk to those guys and find out what it's like when you talk about yeah. isolation, being in yeah. a bleak, cold, miserable location. Yes, you're yeah. working and doing research. Yeah, to actually have a chat with some of those guys would be absolutely brilliant. Yeah. And there's men and women who are doing that sort of work. So, right. um, but yeah, it's just, we, you know, two years ago, or not quite two years ago, we started the Campfire Project. It's been growing beautifully. I think COVID-19 uh, is... Well, it's probably helped the Campfire Project yeah. because people realise yeah. they need more of this. Mm. And we've got these conversations going, which are absolutely brilliant. Mm. But uh, like all these conversations or the panel discussions, when I, when I get into them with people, uh, the 60 minutes goes really fast <laughs> and we usually <laughs> extend beyond it, which I think we probably have. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank all of you for being here today, Adam, uh, Paul and uh, Sharon. Thank, thank you very much for being here. And uh, to everybody else who's, <coughs> excuse me, everybody else who's out there, I hope you got a lot out of today. Um, if you've got any questions, please ask them. And uh, we'll see you on the next uh, panel discussion. Bye for now. Thanks, Alan. Bye, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.